<clears throat> All right, so this is uh, the third lecture of the second unit, and this is muscle tissue. And so, this again, sort of corresponds nicely with what we're doing in lab, where you guys are identifying all the skeletal muscle uh, in lab. Here in lecture, we're going to look more at the physiology of muscle and how it works and how it actually contracts um, and sort of put all those pieces together. So, this is a quick introduction, as you guys know by, what, by now very well. There are three types of muscle tissue, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle tissue. Um, you guys know all the different types from skeletal muscle, smooth, and cardiac in terms of their differences, so I'm not going to run through that again. Um, but skeletal muscle, of course, is attached to our bones and allows movement, um, but also has some other functions uh, other than just movement, as we have listed here. Uh, help maintain posture, support soft tissues, guard entrances and exits. Those first four, I think, are probably pretty self-evident. You probably make sense of those and understand that those are things that skeletal muscle does. A couple of you may not have been as aware of are um, the fact that it helps maintain body temperature. When your muscles contract, it produces heat, right? And so, like shivering, firming, or genesis, we'll talk about that later in AMP2 as a mechanism for your body to help maintain heat when you get very cold. Uh, but also, your muscle has the ability to store nutrient reserves, which is a really important feature. It can take sugar and use it, of course, to like make ATP, the muscle can, uh, but it also can store it. The storage form of glucose is glycogen, uh, and it can actually store some sugar. So your muscle has a great capacity to, to take in sugar and very useful for the body in that it can get it out of the bloodstream uh, and into the muscle. All right, so muscle consists of muscle tissue, of course, but it must have connective tissue also, connective tissue so that it can compartmentalize the muscle itself, but also attach to bones, right, so that movement can occur. Nerves are also essential to the function of muscles because um, that's where the command comes from, right? And skeletal muscle contraction, we said it's voluntary, starts even in the brain and the spinal cord, and arrives at the muscle via nerves. So nerves, we'll talk about nerves and it's called the neuromuscular junction later. So that's very important. And then blood vessels are, of course, obviously essential to skeletal muscle function. Uh, it's how blood muscle vessels are how the muscle will get nutrients and oxygen and also be able to, you know, take away waste products. All right, so connective tissue, as I said, really important part of muscle. Uh, muscle actually has three layers of connective tissue that all come together to form the tendon that's going to attach the muscle to the bone. So you have the epimesium, paramesium, uh, and endomesium. The epimesium is basically just a complete exterior layer of collagen fibers around the muscle, so it separates each individual muscle from the surrounding tissue. The paramesium is the next deeper layer of uh, connective tissue that surrounds what are called muscle bundles or fascicles. Um, and then the final deepest layer of connective tissue is called the endomesium, and this surrounds each individual muscle cell um, where the actual muscle fibers are contained. And so you can see in this image, say you have you know your bicep here, completely surrounding the bicep is going to be the epimesium. And you can also see it right here, right? Connective tissue layer completely surrounding muscle. Uh, that's the epimesium. But if you look, there are these muscle fascicles, all these little bundles there. And each one of those bundles is surrounded by what's called the paramesium, which you can see there, right? And so if you pull one of those out, you have the paramesium. And there's your muscle fascicle. And then finally, each muscle fascicle is then also subdivided, and that's surrounded by an endomesium, uh, and that's your deepest layer. And the endomesium surrounds each muscle cell, and within each muscle cell are what are called now fibrils, which are made up of the actual contractile proteins that are going to cause skeletal muscle to contract. All right? All right, so this connective tissue then, the endomesium, paramesium, and epimesium, as I said, sort of compartmentalizes the muscle tissue, but also comes together at the end of the muscles to form the attachment to bone, right, as a tendon or aponeurosis. Um, blood vessels and nerves, as I said, are also going to play a very important role in muscle contractions. 
uh, muscles have extensive vascular systems that, of course, are going to supply large amounts of oxygen, as I said before, and nutrients, but also be able to carry away waste products. And again, skeletal muscles are voluntary, right? They need nervous impulses from either the brain or spinal cord in order for it to contract. So we'll look at how um, ner the nervous system plays a, a central role in muscle contraction. All right, so looking at skeletal muscle cells themselves, they start um, through the development of what are called myoblasts, that term again, you're familiar with blasts when we talked about fibroblasts and osteoblasts. Here we're talking about myoblasts. These are ultimately going to form muscle cells which are typically very long, very large, and have hundreds of nuclei, which you guys know, that's why we call them multinucleates. Okay? Uh, and you can see in this image, several myoblasts fusing together okay, and ultimately forming um, a muscle fiber. And as you can see, the muscle cell is made up of myofibrils, and each of those myofibrils are the contractile proteins which give the muscle its striped or banded appearance. So, to understand how muscle contracts, we need to really sort of take an in-depth, close look at all the players, so to speak, that are involved in muscle contraction. We're going to start with the membrane that can surrounds each muscle cell. And that membrane is called a sarcolemma. Okay? The membrane, just like other cells, right? like if you drew a picture of a cube-shaped cell, right? it would have a nucleus in the middle right? and have a cell membrane around the outside, right? just like cells we studied before. Most cells have membranes. Okay? Um, and so this is the membrane of this given um, skeletal muscle, right? And what's really significant about this, not only does it house, you know, the, the cytoplasmic content inside the muscle, just like other cell membranes do, but it also is the site of communication between the nervous system and the muscle. And so we'll see eventually that a nerve ending basically uh, comes to the point of what's called the neuromuscular junction at the sarcolemma and ultimately uh, can receive a neurotransmitter which will cause a change in transmembrane potential which will lead to muscle contraction. So the sarcolemma is going to be very important in terms of looking at how, it's, uh, how this muscle contraction looks. Attached to the sarcolemma, this membrane, are things called the transverse tubules or T-tubules. And essentially, this transmit, these T-tubules are connected and attached to um, the sarcolemma. And as I said, the sarcolemma is the site of communication with the nervous system. And so an action potential will begin at the sarcolemma and then be transmitted deep into the muscle cell through this T-tubule system. Okay, so it basically has the same properties as sarcolemma, except it's a membranous um, sort of network deep into the muscle uh, fiber itself. Okay, and so if you look at an image of this muscle fiber, you can see the sarcolemma here, right, of the outside. Right, this whole thing is a sarcolemma. But then you can see all these yellow pathways, and these are all the T-tubules. Right? All right, so the muscle fiber then has this, you know, myofibrils on the inside, which are the basically compartmentalized subdivisions within the muscle fibers, and these are where the actual protein filaments are located, also referred to as myofilaments. And these myofilaments are responsible for muscle contraction, essentially. There are two types of myofilaments. We have basically thin and thick filaments. The thin are called actin, the thin are called myosin and the sort of the organization of these thin and thick filaments are what give skeletal muscle its striated or banded or striped appearance because the thick filaments appear darker, right? So that's dark, and the thin filaments are lighter. And so that's dark light, dark light. That alternating dark light, dark light is what gives you that striped or striated appearance of these myofibrils. Now, around each one of these, um, myofibril is a membranous structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a set really important because it holds calcium essentially. It stores calcium. Right? CA positive. Right? 
it stores calcium. Okay? And this is really important because it also forms these expanded chambers called terminal cisterna that really concentrate and store really large amounts of calcium. And if you look deep in the muscle, you'll find what's called a triad. And a triad is one T-tubule and two terminal cisterna, and that's where you have lots of uh, calcium, concentrated high concentration of calcium. And calcium is essentially released from the terminal cisterna as the impulse arrives uh, and that'll into the sarcomere, and that allows muscle contraction to begin. So we'll look at that as part of the process. And so here, in this image, is a nice image of a triad, right? You have terminal cisterna here, terminal cisterna here, T2 little here, right? Three parts, triad, okay? Um, and you can see when the impulse travels down the T2 wheel and arrives at the triad, okay? That is going to lead to muscle contraction because when the impulse arrives at the triad, calcium is going to be released. Calcium is essentially the on-off switch for muscle contraction. And so you need calcium to be released in order for the muscle to be able to contract. So that's going to play a really important role as, in it as well. So within these myofibrils, the smallest structural or contractile unit of a myofibril is what's known as a sarcomere. Okay, and a sarcomere, again, the stripe patterns come from these dark and light thin, thick and thin filaments alternating, uh, and that's where the stripes come from. The thick filament is also known as the A-band in the sarcomere. The thin filament is also known as the I-band. Okay? Um, and if you look at a sarcomere, the I-band is made up of three parts. The M-line, which is the center of the, of the sarcomere, essentially, the H-band, uh, which has only thick filaments, and then the zone of overlap, which is really important because the zone of overlap has is the really darkest area that you're going to see in the striped part because it has both thick and thin filaments. So if you look at thick and thin filaments on top of each other, right, overlapping one another, you can see that's going to be really dark. And so that's where the darkest area under the microscope comes from is this zone of overlap in the, um, in the A-band. Okay? That's the A-band. The I-band, primary thing is it's just basically only thin filaments, right? And so you have the centers of the I-band um, that make up that. And so this is a nice image where you can see the A-band, right? Dark, I-band, light. Light, dark, light, dark, and it just keeps alternating, and that's where your stripes come from. Okay? Um, you can also see the components of the A-band, and especially you can see really well the zone of overlap, right, where the thick and thin filaments overlap with one another. Okay, and those will become really important as, we, as we'll see a little bit later, right? And so here is the nice um, dark light, dark light image that you see is typical of skeletal muscle. All right, so at this point then, we've looked at um, the skeletal muscle as a whole, having the epimesium, the fascicle, the muscle fiber, we've gotten down to the mouth fibril, and then all the way down to the sarcomere. So we just keep sort of paring it down and going deeper and deeper uh, in terms of, of analyzing the tissue until we finally get the sarcomere. We actually can look at the thick and thin filaments of the actin and myosin, which are the actual contractile proteins. And so that's what we want to look at next is look at these thick and thin filaments in great detail and see how they actually work and how contraction proceeds. So the first one to look at is what's called the thin filament, right, which is the actin. And the thin filament uh, is made up uh, primarily of what's called F-actin, which is essentially two twisted rows of G-actin molecules. Okay? And the G-actin molecules are very interesting because they have what are called active sites, that can bind to the thick film or the myosin. Okay? Um, and so if you look at an, an image of the thin filament, you can see the G-actin molecules, right? These red balls and the yellow tip of the red ball, that is the uh, active site that will attach to the uh, thick filament. Okay? So that's one part, one big part of those F-actin strand made up of these G-actin molecules. The other Second part is the tropomyosin, okay, which is a double strand that covers those active sites, thereby preventing thick and thin filament interaction. And then the third part is the troponin, which is a globular protein that binds tropomy tropomyosin to the G-actin, 
but also can bind a calcium ion, which is going to be really important because the calcium, when it binds to the troponin, will cause the tropomyosin complex to essentially move out of the way and expose the active site. So that'll be a concept that we'll look at uh, in a little bit. Okay, so that's the thin filament, right? Has the G-active molecules with the active sites, has the tropomyosin that covers the active sites, and then you have the troponin, which is not only attached to the tropomyosin, but also can bind to calcium, which will, once that happens, expose those active sites on those G-active molecules. All right, so as you can see in the slide, calcium binds to its receptor on the troponin molecule. This troponin tropomyosin complex changes, and you see exposure of the active sites um, to allow for thick and thin filament, what we call cross bridge formation, to occur. All right, so that's the thin filament. The thick filament, a little bit simpler, basically has these, you know, 300 twisted myosin subunits, which have a tail but also have a head. And the head is what actually reaches and can attach to the nearest thin filament once those active sites are exposed. Okay, so if you look at this image, you can see the myosin tail, but you can see the head here as well. And the head also is attached to this thing called the hinge, and it basically allows the myosin head to pivot. And that pivoting, uh, if you think of hundreds of thousands of myosin heads pivoting in unison, that is ultimately what it's going to be uh, cause shortening and muscle contraction to occur. Okay? So, during contraction, as I said, um, the myosin heads interact with the thin filaments, forming cross bridges, and then they pivot, which is, is going to result in motion. Okay? All right, so that then leads to what's called the sliding filament theory, where the thick filament ex essentially attaches to the thin filament and pivots, and basically causes the thin filaments to slide towards the M line. So the A zone is going to stay the same, but the Z lines will move closer together. All right? So here you can see in relaxation um, and then during contraction, everything shortens, right? Because those thick filaments are pulling the thin filaments towards that center, center line. All right? So now that we understand all the players involved and have a good sort of idea of how these all these structures and the contractile proteins are organized, we can now sort of take a look at the whole process of contraction from neural stimulation at the sarcolemma to the actual muscle fiber contracting to then varying levels of tension production depending on uh, a, a several different factors. And so that's what we want to look at. We want to look at this whole process from the nervous system initiating contraction all the way down to the muscle contracting and then tension being produced. Okay? And so it starts at what's called the neuromuscular junction or NMJ, right? And this is a very special intercellular connection between the nervous system and the skeletal system, right? You have skeletal muscle system. You have these two distinct components, nervous and skeletal muscle, and essentially they need to communicate with one another, right? And so we want to see how that communication occurs and ultimately is going to control calcium ion release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which will lead to muscle contraction. Right? And so basically what happens is you have an, uh, a motor neuron, for instance, like in your brain or your spinal cord, that's going to initiate a contraction, that, or excuse me, initiate an electrical impulse or action potential. That impulse will then travel down the axon and arrive at the muscle, at the sarcolemma. And so that's what we want to see what happens. So in the first step at rest, you can see you have the nervous component here, you have the muscle component here with the sarcolemma. And as you can see, there's this space called the synaptic cleft. It's not actually connected. There's actually a little space in between the nervous part and the muscle part. Um, and that is an essential role in terms of how this thing is going to work. So. Um, in the first slide, we sort of, as you see there, we just have sort of setting the scene, so to speak. Uh, and then ultimately, the second step, the action potential then arrives um, at the site of the synaptic connection. Uh, and then when it arrives, it's going to depolarize this membrane of the neuron and cause release of the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is in, contained in these vesicles. It's known as acetylcholine or ACH. And it's the only neurotransmitter you need to be concerned about right now, 
Um, but there are many different types of neurotransmitters. You've probably heard of them. They're essentially chemical messengers. They're chemicals that communicate a message to a target. And so acetylcholine is one. You've probably heard of serotonin, dopamine, um, GABA, um, epinephrine, you know, a whole host of different types of neurotransmitters that ultimately target the membrane and communicate a message. And so when this impulse arrives, um, it causes release of the neurotransmitter or the ACH out into the synaptic cleft. Right? And as you look at the sarcolemma, which is here, you'll see there are receptors for that ACH on the sarcolemma. And so sure enough, once those um, exocytosis of acetylcholine goes out in the synaptic cleft, those acetylcholine molecules then bind to the receptors on the sarcolemma. And when that happens, it basically goes through a process of called depolarization, whereas positively charged sodium ions can enter the cell, depolarizing that membrane. And when you depolarize a membrane, that means the charge across that membrane is becoming more positive. So typically, a resting membrane potential is, say, like negative 70 millivolts, for instance. If this acetylcholine binds, it opens up channels on that membrane, and the sodium ions rush into the cell. Instead of being, you know, negative 70 before, the charge is going to become much more positive, and that's what a depolarization is, right? Because all these positive charges are going into the cell. And so as a result, you now have an action potential in the muscle. And so it's in the membrane of the sarcolemma, and if you recall, the T tubule is attached to the membrane, and that's how the impulse then travels deep into the muscle fiber. Okay? Now, another important part of the um, muscle uh, synaptic cleft are these little moon-shaped guys after the impulse is complete. And we call that acetylcholine hysterase, which basically breaks down the acetylcholine and essentially inactivating the sites and ending the impulse. Okay? Because obviously you don't want your muscles always to be contracted. Right? You need contraction, but you also need relaxation. And so the ACHE will work with that. All right? So we now have our impulse in the muscle. We see how it's started in the nervous system and how it got communicated essentially to the muscle. And now it's in the muscle. And as that impulse then travels down the T-tubule system, as you guys know from previously, that impulse is now going to go travel down through this T-tubule system and reach the triad. The triad, if you recall, is, recall, is where we have the two terminal cisterna and one T-tubule. And that's where high concentrations of calcium are located. And when that impulse arrives there, calcium is going to be released. Right? Calcium is going to be released. We're going to see how calcium plays a really important role, uh, essentially in triggering contraction and allowing those thick and thin filaments to interact. Right? And so as you can see in this image, the calcium is released at rest in the first, in, in, in A, right at rest. You can see the trophomycin uh, is covering the active site. So there's no way for the thick and thin filaments to interact. It right? can't happen. Okay? But when calcium is released, right? And it binds, you can see it moves the calcium out of the way, and now the active sites are exposed. And once the active sites are exposed, you get thick and thin film interaction. All right, and so that's what's going to happen. That's why we call calcium sort of the on off switch for muscle contraction, because um, it is what allows for the active sites to be exposed and allow for cross bridge formation. All right, so once we have cross bridge formation, or we'll talk about Part of that, we'll look at all the processes involved in it. Right? So the first thing that happens again is that calcium is released from those terminal cisterna of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When that calcium is released, it is going to bind to the troponin. And when it does that, it exposes the active sites. See the active sites sort of here in yellow are now exposed. And once those active sites are exposed, we will see thick and thin filament interaction, as you can see right here. Okay? Once you have thick and thin filament action, you have a cross bridge formation, right? And these energized myosin heads will then pivot in the next stop process using their energy, right? Taking that energy, causing the myosin head to pivot, and that's what's going to move toward the end line. We call this action the power stroke, uh, and the rest of that ADP and the phosphate group are released. 
and muscle contraction happens. Okay, so that myosin head pivoting is actually the power stroke of muscle fiber shortening. Okay, now another ATP is needed for relaxation as well to have cross bridge detachment. So a subsequent ATP molecule, as you can see, causes uh, cross bridge uh, detachment to occur, uh, and then the ATP is basically split back into ADP and P, and this, AD, this energy from that splitting of the ATP uh, is used to then recalc the myosin head back into position. Right? And so um, then it'll be ready to go again. Once it cross bridge formation occurs, the myosin head can pivot. So the, the, you need ATP for contraction, but you also need ATP for relaxation. So as the myosin head pivots, the muscle fiber shortens, and tension is produced. All right, and relaxation depends on several things, right? How long this contraction, uh, you know, relaxation, of course, is going to depend on um, ATP, but contraction duration is going to depend on uh, how long the stimulus is from the nervous system, how much calcium, how much ATP is available. All these things are going to have an impact uh, on contraction. So, when relaxation happens, calcium concentration falls, calcium detaches, active sites are recovered by tropomyosin, and basically, once the active sites are recovered, there's no way for thick and thin filaments to interact, and you have complete relaxation of the muscle. Um, so, you've probably heard of rigor mortis. This is a fixed muscular contraction after death. Basically, iron pumps are not producing uh, ATP anymore. Calcium can build up in the sarcoplasmic reticulum until there's um, the active sites are remaining exposed, um, and ATP is not being manufactured, and so the cross bridge detachments remain. And so it's a fixed muscular contraction after death. Okay, and so this is just sort of a summary if you want to read through that. Um, and this is also a summary of the steps involved. If you can look at the steps of contraction, I would read through all these steps, and then also the steps involved in relaxation. All right, so that's muscle contraction. That's how this process works. Now, the next concept we want to look at is what's called tension production, right? Your muscles don't always produce the same amount of tension, right? Um, it can produce more or less depending on what you're doing, right? If I lift a pencil versus lifting a 50-pound weight, right, can you see how there's going to be a different amount of tension that needs to be produced in order for that to occur, okay? And so tension production can depend on the number of pivoting cross bridges, the fibrous resting length, how frequent it is stimulated by the nervous system. So several factors uh, that can impact uh, how much tension is produced. And the first thing is what we call length tension relationship. And this just basically says that how much overlap is between those thick and thin filaments. Optimum overlap is going to produce the great amount of, greatest amount of tension. If you have too much overlap or too little overlap, you're not going to be able to produce as much tension. Okay? And so um, if you look at this slide, figure 1014, you can see very little tension is going to be produced, right? This is tension percent, right? On this on the axis here, right? Zero to one hundred. So very little tension is going to be uh, produced if you have no overlap, right? There's no very minimal amount of tension to produce because there's no way for the thick and thin filaments to interact with one another. There has to be a certain amount of overlap. And so as you can see, as overlap increases and goes towards this slide, right? That's where you're going to have the most tension that you can produce when you have the optimal amount of thick and thin filament overlap. And the same is it goes the other direction. It's the muscle becomes more compacted and there's, there's no room really for the muscle to pivot and shorten, so to speak, tension production will also go down. All right? So that's one thing that can be impacted. Another is the frequency of stimulation, right? The, how um, frequent the nerve impulse stimulates the muscle. Um, and what we've looked at, just for sort of simplicity's sake, Take is to look at a single neural stimulation, right? We've kept it pretty simple and just said, here's one impulse, this is how a muscle contracts. In reality, that's probably going to produce a twitch, which is going to last like, you know, 
50 milliseconds or something. Really short. That's not going to do anything in reality, right? A sustained muscle contraction like to get you to walk from point A to point B or do an exercise activity or something are going to require many repeated stimuli, often at a really high frequency. Okay? So if we look at a twitch, for instance, um, which again is probably not going to do much for you, uh, a twitch can be broken down into three components, a latent period, contraction period, and a relaxation period. Okay? And if you look at this image of figure 1015B, you can see and the green arrow is showing the stimulus arriving from the nervous system. First thing is there is a latent period where no tension is produced, right? That latent period is because there, it takes time, right, for the impulse to travel down to the muscle and then to depolarize the membrane and cause release of calcium, expose the active sites. All those things take a little bit of time. So you have this latent period first. But then, once the calcium is released and the cross-bridge formation occurs, we can see tension goes up, right, because contraction occurs, so maximal tension. And then once the acetylcholine esterase removes the ACH, calcium is reabsorbed, ATP, subsequent ATP uh, detaches the cross bridge, and then we get reduce our tension, right? So that's a twitch, right? Sort of creates this, this arc, right? Of contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. And really, to produce anything significant, right, you need to sort of limit the um, relaxation phase. So if you look at this image, trepa is an increase in tension, um, but it's the next impulse is not coming until after the relaxation. So basically you're getting is a series of twitches essentially, one after the other, because the impulse frequency is not high enough. Okay? That leads into what's called wave summation. And wave summation is essentially when a next, a successive stimuli starts arriving before relaxation phase is completed, and you can see tension is increasing. That builds to what's called incomplete tetanus, which is um, you still have the relaxation phase uh, because the frequency is not quite as high. But what really is sort of the goal of this and the, the topic that I'm trying to tell you about is achieving what we call complete tetanus, and that is when the frequency uh, stimulus is so high that the relaxation phase is completely eliminated, right? There's no dip, as you can see in figure 1016B, right? There's no dip because the frequency of impulses is coming so high that you're reaching maximum ten uh, tension. And so complete tetanus is really what normal muscle contraction is, happens, like in terms of, you know, typical muscle contraction is going to involve complete tetanus, right? Like if you want to walk somewhere or exercise or lift something heavy, that's going to involve complete tetanus to produce tension that will allow for uh, motion to occur. Okay? Um, so these factors contribute to tension production. Another way to look at tension production is based on what we call motor units. And skeletal muscle contains motor units that contract at the same time and can control by a single motor unit. But not all muscle fibers have just one motor unit. Some muscle groups have multiple motor units, and not all may be used if you're not lifting something very heavy, right? But to achieve maximum tension, all those motor units are going to need to be able to uh, reach tetanus. So like if you look at this image, figure 1017, you can see, let's say this is your bicep right here, and you see your bicep is not controlled by just one motor neuron, right? It might be several, it might be three or four or five or six motor neurons that innervate different sections of that muscle fiber. And so if you're lifting something that's not very heavy, for instance, uh, the purple motor neuron may only fire. And so accordingly, only the purple parts are going to contract. And you see how that's not going to produce as much tension as if all of those would fire. And so, again, to have complete tetanus of a, to reach maximum tension a muscle can do, you would have to have recruit all motor units to fire at the same time so that the whole muscle fiber can contract. All right? All right, so um, that's what a lot of the factors that impact uh, tension production, okay? Now, another topic with tension production is the types of contraction based on the pattern of tension production. 
Some tension production causes motion to occur. Some tension production does not allow motion to occur. And those two types are called isotonic, which in, in which mo motion results, or isometric, which there is no motion that results. Okay? And so isotonic contraction is, um, again, where the muscle changes the length and the result is motion. Okay? And there are two types of isotonic contractions. Okay? You have what's called a concentric contraction and an eccentric contraction. Concentric contraction is where the muscle shortens and the tension that's produced exceeds the resistance, right? So think about a bicep curl. If you start at your hip and curl up to your shoulder, all right, it's a very simple, basic uh, strength training exercise. As that muscle lifts up to your shoulder, the bicep does, that bicep is going through concentric contraction at that time, okay? If the muscle then, bicep then returns, slowly returns that dumbbell back down to your hips, right? The muscle's lengthening, but it's still building tension. That's called an eccentric contraction. So an easy way to sort of think of it is concentric is shortening, eccentric is lengthening. Concentric and eccentric in terms of isotonic contractions. Okay? And those are some images to sort of show how that works. Muscle shortening or muscle lengthening. Isometric contraction is where the skull and muscle develops tension. But there is no change in length, right? Iso meaning the same, metric meaning measure or length, right? And so there is no change in length in an isometric contraction. So a good example of an isometric contraction would be like uh, like plank. Like you guys have probably heard of plank position. So you've probably done that before, like where you're on your on your elbows and toes sort of facing the ground and your abdominal muscles are in fully engaged in contraction, but you're not moving. You're just holding that position still. It's a great example of an isometric contraction. All right? So those are the different types of contractions based on their pattern of tension uh, production. All right? All right. So um, next thing we want to look at is the energetics of contractions. Okay, and that is um, powered by adenosine triphosphate. We call ATP the currency of muscle contraction. What do we mean by the currency of muscle contraction? Well, just that any time a myosin head is going to pivot, it's going to cost an ATP. When the myosin head wants to detach and relax, it's going to cost an ATP. So there's a very high demand of ATP in order to sustain, sustain muscle contractions off and on, contracting and relaxation, right? Uh, and so this ATP then we call it the currency of muscle contraction because really it's the cost of doing business, right? Want the myosin had to pivot, ATP. Want the myosin had to detach, ATP, okay? Um, and sustained muscle contraction really uses a lot of ATP and your muscle really cannot store that much. It can maybe store enough to get the contraction started, but if they're going to, your muscle is going to do something that's going to continue for a long period of time, right? These muscles need to continue to manufacture ATP to continue on, okay? And so we know that ATP is manufactured really in two ways, aerobically or anaerobically, and that's where we want to sort of begin our discussion. Now, as I said, ATP, um, your muscle actually can store some ATP. It stores it as uh, ATP and creatine phosphate, so really it's um, adenosine triphosphate basically gives a phosphate molecule to the creatine, and you have creatine phosphate. So it's ADP plus creatine phosphate is the storage form of ATP. I have ADP plus creatine phosphate. Right? That is the storage form of ATP. Okay. And your muscle has limited capacity to store uh, ATP, okay? And so when it needs the ATP, it can recharge that a adenosine diphosphate back to ATP using the enzyme, enzyme creatine kinase, or CK. Um, and when that stored ATP is used up, then your body needs to generate ATP in other ways. And those other ways, again, are either aerobic or anaerobic metabolism, okay? Again, resting muscle contains enough stored ATP, maybe just for a few, few moments of activity, but then to work over a prolonged period, 
you're going to need additional ATP uh, being manufactured. And so there are two ways, again, aerobic and anaerobic. And there's a big difference between the both, between the two of them, right? Um, aerobic metabolism, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is generation of ATP with oxygen, okay? Typically, this is moderate to, you know, resting to moderate activity levels, maybe walking or even a light jog. Uh, aerobics classes, you've heard that term before, right? Because they can do the activity for a long period of time because the intensity level is such that your body can still deliver oxygen to the muscles so it can continue to manufacture uh, ATP aerobically. And it's very efficient. It uses sugar and oxygen or fat fed into the mitochondria, and ATP is produced. Uh, so you get 34 ATP molecules per glucose molecule that's fed into the system. So you get a big bang for your buck, right? A lot of ATP uh, that's being uh, manufactured. So it's produced in the mitochondria, uses oxygen, high efficiency of um, ATP production. Um, but again, it's only resting the moderate activity level. If your activity level starts to ramp up or it's even greater, like if you're going for a walk and then you decide, oh, maybe I'll jog for a little bit, you're probably still working aerobically. But then at some point, if your intensity continues to climb, like say you're running along and then there's a hill and you're like, oh, I'm going to run up this hill. At some point, your body has to switch to what's called anaerobic metabolism. This is generation of ATP without oxygen. We call that glycolysis because it just happens in the cell. Breaks down glucose from glycogen that's stored in the muscle, and it's not as efficient, right? So typically, this type of activity doesn't last as long, right? You, can't, you can walk probably for 30 minutes, but how, how long can you run up a hill or sprint all out, right? Not, not quite as long. And so that is only producing about two ATP. And so this is very strenuous activity level, like sprinting or um, weightlifting. You know, these are all good examples of anaerobic metabolism, right? So make sure you have a really strong understanding of the way our body manufactures ATP, both aerobically uh, and anaerobically. Okay. Um, so the energy use, skeletal muscles you know, metabolize fats and sugar, um, and during light activity or at rest, you can see here three different scenarios, resting, moderate, and peak activity. And so these images sort of show what's happening at rest, right? Here's your blood vessel delivering fat and oxygen and sugar into the muscle, right? And the mitochondria can produce ATP. Uh, it can store any excess glucose and glycogen and it can store what ATP is needed as creatine, phosphate, and ADP. All right, we talked about that. So that's at rest. When your activity level starts to go up a little bit, right? Fat and sugar can be used, fed into the mitochondria again. You get a big bang for your buck in terms of ATP production. Byproduct is CO2, which the body can handle and is easily released um, uh, out through the blood and into, up, up through the lungs. Um, and then if your activity level continues, right, to get really high, your body cannot deliver oxygen efficiently enough, so your body switches over to anaerobic metabolism, and mitochondria are not used. This is done only in the cell through what's called glycolysis, and you get very little ATP, right, just about two ATP for every molecule of sugar, and so it only provides about one-third of, of ATP, and you get a byproduct of lactic acid, uh, which can also be challenging for the body in terms of, you know, essentially altering the pH and damaging membranes and things like that. So, big difference between aerobic and anaerobic uh, metabolism. Now, when muscle no longer perform a given activity, right, we say those are fatigued. Um, it can be a result of depletion of metabolic reserves and nutrients. Um, again, lactic acid can impact the pH. Uh, it could be a damage to the membrane. A lot of things can cause muscle fatigue and pain. Um, active muscles, of course, produce heat, as I talked about before, um, and it can really contribute to raising body temperature. So when you exercise, your body temperature goes up. Of course, you sweat to combat that as the fluid uh, can help the, the sweat that's produced on your skin surface can help release, release some heat. Now, in terms of muscle performance, um, there are basically sort of two ends that you can look at. 
force and endurance. Force is how much tension can be produced. Endurance is just how long an activity can be sustained. And those are really the two sort of parameters that you can, you know, train or work for, right? Is, is can you change the amount of tension? Can you change how long you can do it? Um, and force and endurance can depend on the type of muscle fibers and the type of exercise training you do can really have an impact. So there are three major muscle fiber types. Uh, we want to look at the first two primarily, fast twitch and slow twitch fibers. Fast twitch fibers are fibers that, just like the name says, contract very quickly. They typically have a larger diameter, large glycogen reserves, not as many mitochondria, but have very powerful contractions, but don't last quite as long, right? And so that is typical, as you can see, is really designed more for uh, anaerobic types of activities. So your sprinter, for instance, like your world-class sprinter, if you took a biopsy of their muscle tissue and analyzed the actual content, you would find, most likely, a much higher percentage of fast twitch fibers than the other types, slow twitch fibers, which are more geared for aerobic activity. Um, most everybody, generally speaking, has a pretty even split of fast twitch to slow twitch. But again, there's a genetic predisposition to either having one or the other could um, you know, be beneficial for that person uh, performing at higher levels of those types of activities. So that's fast twitch. Slow twitch fibers is the opposite, right? Not quite as powerful, but they don't fatigue as easily. Okay? They have a small diameter, typically more mitochondria, uh, lots of blood vessels, highly vascularized, and therefore have a high oxygen supply. So as you might guess, these, since they have a high oxygen supply, right, these are going to be more conditioned for aerobic activity. So again, if you have a, you know, Olympic marathon runner, we did a muscle biopsy of the quadricep muscle, analyze it for fiber type, you would probably see a higher, much higher percentage of slow twitch fibers in their muscle, um, so like a distance runner or cyclist, uh, those types of muscle fibers are conditioned for that activity. Okay? Uh, and so here's a nice image of that. You can see um, fast twitch fibers uh, are larger in diameter, don't have as much color, right, because they don't typically really have quite as much blood flow. They're easier to be fatigued. So it's kind of like white meat, right? Like white meat, like you have, um, like, you know, turkey dinner on Thanksgiving, white meat versus dark meat is basically fast twitch versus slow twitch fibers, right? Slow twitch fibers are smaller in diameter, have a darker color because they have more vascularity, they're fatigue resistant, okay? Um, and so here's a nice sort of uh, table sort of comparing fast twitch and slow twitch. You want to take a look at that. That's a, quite interesting. So muscle performance again. Most, most humans have just a nice mix of fibers, right? And so the color would sort of be a pinkish color. But again, fibers, white fibers are going to be, or excuse me, fast twitch fibers are going to be mostly white in appearance, right? Paler, right? Like the chicken breast because it doesn't have as much vascularity, right? Um, dark meat, right, is going to be mostly slow twitch fibers because higher level of vascularity and so you can see a difference uh, in those. Now, muscle can either go to one of two ways. It can either go through what's called hypertrophy or atrophy. Muscle will atrophy if it's not trained or used, right? It's sort of that slogan, use it or lose it, really applies here because muscle will gradually go the way of atrophying if it's not used. Um, and when you atrophy a muscle, it loses size, tone, and power. Uh, muscle hypertrophy is a result from training, right? It increases the diameter, the number of myofibrils. You can see an increase of mitochondria. The ability for your muscle to store sugar can go up. Um, so a lot of things can happen with training uh, in hypertrophy. And so there really are two paths you can go with conditioning and training. You can go the power route or the endurance route. If you're going to try to train your muscles for power, right, you're going to do more anaerobic types of activities, right, like frequent, brief, intense workouts, you're going to see greater hypertrophy. But because you do a lot of weightlifting, that doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're going to be able to run a 10K race, right, because you haven't trained your muscle for that, right? 
So aerobic activities are supported more by mitochondria and require oxygen. And so you can train these muscles to work more efficiently uh, in endurance training. So, um, you know, again, just because you train for aerobic activities doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to lift a, uh, a large amount of weight. So there's a sort of a trade-off uh, between the two. All right? All right, so again, with exercise, use it or lose it is really relevant. Um, muscle will, you know, atrophy, uh, especially as we age, if it's not used very much. Um, and obviously that can, you know, cause challenges. We looked at, like, muscle, severe mus muscle atrophy issues, like in um, Lou Gehrig's disease and other types of uh, ailments um, that, that can occur. So. Uh, exercise and, and keeping your muscles active, especially as you age, can, can be very important. All right, so that's it for this lecture. Um, that'll be, again, sort of a wrap for the second unit. The next one will be on the nervous system, uh, and we'll take it from there.